All right, good evening, friends. We're going to continue uh, our practical halakha course tonight. Uh, but in preparation for Purim, we're going to start discussing uh, the, the very practical laws of Purim. Pardon me. Uh, and we'll, we'll be looking today at the mitzvot of Matanot Lev Yonim, uh, giving gifts to the poor, and of uh, Mishloch Manot, uh, sending uh, food uh, packages to, to friends. Uh, we'll wait for a few more minutes. Hopefully, we'll have some more people joining us, and then we'll, we'll embark. Okay. All right, so uh, good evening, friends. Purim is coming up. Uh, we're now, this week we'll have Rosh Chodesh. Thursday and Friday is Rosh Chodesh Adar Bet. Uh, this week, this year we had the um, sometimes confusing addition of an extra month of Adar. And the, the extra month is actually the first Adar. Uh, we, we insert and start the month there. So the Purim, the festival of Purim and all of the mitzvot of Adar, uh, including the four special Torah readings that we have, uh, that we had the first of which this past, this past week because it takes place or just before Rosh Chodesh Adar, uh, the Parshat Shkalim, which we read about the giving of the half shekel donation to purchase the animals that would serve as the sacrifices in the temple. Uh, and then we have three more uh, special readings for the month of Adar. First is Parshat Zachor. I mean, second, I guess, is Parshat Zachor. We just had the first in Shkalim. Zachor is we remember the mitzvah to obliterate Amalek, to annihilate uh, the Amalekites. The Amalekites were a, a, um, a sort of a desert raider tribe, uh, you know, that, uh, that lived, you know, in the southern, you know, Negev, uh, sort of in that that large, vast desert, which is sort of um, Israel, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, from from a lot, uh, the city of a lot, you can see four different countries, you can go up a hill, and you can see four different countries there, you can see Egypt, and Israel, and Jordan, and Saudi Arabia. Uh, and they're all relatively close to one another. So that whole area of that southern uh, wilderness uh, is, is not in, is not and never was a very fertile area. It's not a place for uh, for agriculture, uh, and the primary way that the people who lived there uh, sort of made their living was piracy. Right, that they were they were raiders. Uh, they would come and come to villages and and uh, rape, pillage, uh, and make off with the animals and and goods, etc. Uh, and so this was this was the Amalekites were a tribe of that of that variety, right? These <clears throat> ambush people. And so when we were leaving Egypt, uh, they came and they ambushed us. And and the the document the story of that uh, that attack is is in the end of Parshat B'Shalach. That's a, what 
chapter 18 or so of Exodus, uh, give or take, maybe, maybe a little later. Um, as at the very end of Parsha Peshalach, and then we read a special, remember, a reminder, right? Hashem says, before we go into the land of Israel, uh, the end of the Torah, right? And, and, and when Moshe is giving his farewell speech, we have the, the reminder, remember what Amalek did to you. And we have the description of what they did to us. Now, the description doesn't exactly match, uh, or, or there's a lot more detail to the description than there is uh, in, the narr in the narrative of the attack. Uh, and what, what uh, isn't clear in Exodus is the uh, very, uh, very violent and sexual nature of their attack. That there, there was a very clear, uh, you know, in the narrative, in, in the remember, in, you know, when, when we're told to remember what they did to us, uh, what part of what we remember is that they, uh, there was a great deal of sexual violation involved. Um, it wasn't just uh, wasn't just an attack and, and taken us uh, by surprise, killing us and taking our goods. They were not uh, in it for that. And so God has this sort of a a, a feud, a, a lifetime feud with with Amalek, uh, and says that what they represent, we need to get rid of. And He reminds us to remember what they did to us, not to forget what they did to us, and that we are to obliterate the seed of Amalek or anything that uh, is Amalekite. And we read at that time. The story of how Saul, King Saul, failed to uh, carry out that mitzvah, and that when he went to war against the Amalekites, he he took uh, prisoners, uh, specifically their king, and um, and many many flocks, and we're supposed to kill a man, woman, child, uh, animal, and burn all of their goods, take no plunder, you know, everything that is Amalekite is is uh, forbidden to us. Uh, and but he he took uh, took uh, King Agag. In chains as sort of as a prize to you know to to boast as it were uh to took him alive you know and uh and and, and the prophet samuel was very very uh firm with him that this was not what you were supposed to do right that you should have followed god's law and the law there was you should have killed them all and according to our tradition agag was able to propagate his seed even what even in chains uh in that uh, the time that he was in captive in, in, in captivity uh, of, of Saul. Uh, and we see that in the Megillah, when we're going to read Ampurim, Haman is called an Agagi. He's an Agagite. Uh, so Ag Agag was the, was the Amalekite king who, uh, who propagated his seed. Uh, and so we see that the, the feud between Amalek and the Jewish people continues uh, because Saul did not finish the job. Uh, and so, so Haman uh, is there. And you see that Haman wants to annihilate the Jews. Uh, and the Jews are, are commanded to annihilate Amalek. Uh, so Parshat Zachor is the second of the, these four readings. The, the third is about the red cow, the para aduma, which we read about in preparation for Pesach, because if we were in the temple times uh, and we had a red cow, the burnt ashes of the red cow purify, uh, purify us from the defilement of death when anyone who's been in contact with a corpse or in contact with someone who's been in contact with a corpse. Uh, carries that that trace of, of impurity and can't go into the temple uh, and so we would be purified with the sprinkling of the ashes of the red cow in advance of Pesach and so we after Purim in advance of uh, in advance of Pesach we read about that process uh, because we can't uh, in this day we, we, don't, we can't fulfill it so we at least read about it and then the last one is the mitzvah of HaChodesh Hazel Lachem is the setting of the calendar because the month of Nisan, the month in which Pesach uh, falls, is considered the first month, and therefore Adar is the last month of the year, right? This is the December, it's the 12th month of the year, uh, and in the Megillah, right, when it says that, uh, that um, Haman uh, cast lots to determine what was going to be the day that he was going to annihilate the Jews, uh, he came up with the, uh, the 12th month, uh, and I think the 13th day, uh, 13 right 12 13 and that's why the 13th is the fast of esther is, is the day of fasting which was set aside and then, then the 14th is the day uh, that uh, that we celebrated because we were given permission to defend ourselves right and that's all there in the megillah uh, if you haven't read the megillah in advance of purim that's well worth it i know rabbi rosenblatt will be giving some shurim uh, on the text of the megillah uh, in the coming weeks in his monday night uh, tanakh slot 
uh, well worth uh, well worth looking into the Megillah and hearing hearing what he has to say. Um, but today we're going to be looking at the practical halachot of uh, two of the mitzvot of Purim. Right, there are four mitzvot on Purim. The first, uh, as we as we often uh, know, is the reading of the Megillah that we attend in shul and we'll read it out loud and we'll have several readings. Uh, men and women are both uh, required to hear the reading of the Megillah. Now, this is strange uh, to some degree because uh, reading the Megillah is a positive, time-bound commandment, right? It's, it's not something we do every day. It's something we do only on Purim. Uh, and in general, women are, are uh, patur. They're exempt from, from positive, time-bound commandments. Women don't put on tefillin, which is a daytime and not a nighttime commandment. They don't wear tzitzit. Tzitzi, which is a daytime and not a nighttime commandment, therefore is a positive time. But women are not obligated to hear the shofar bolon on Rosh Hashanah, are not obligated to sit in the sukkah, they're not obligated to take the lulav and etrog uh, on, uh, on Sukkot, uh, and so on and so forth. There are some that they are, because when they're attached to a negative commandment, that's sort of the flip side of it. So just like you're from, from matzah, women, is, women are required to eat matzah, because the positive commandment of eating matzah goes with the negative commandment of not eating bread. And so because it's attached, it's sort of a flip, uh, two sides of the coin. So then, then you still have, women still have to do it. And that's why also Shabbat, women uh, have to make Kiddush right? they have, or hear Kiddush because keeping, remembering Shabbat, the positive commandment goes with the negative commandment of not doing any work on Shabbat. And so uh, that's another example. But the, the Megillah is different. Now, why? First and foremost, because it's a rabbinic commandment. It's not written in the Torah, right? The Torah didn't know about Purim. Uh, there are places that there's suggested uh, uh, clues, perhaps, that there would there, there might one day be a, such a thing as Purim. Uh, but uh, Purim is a rabbinic commandment, even though it's in, in scripture, right? The book of Esther is a part of Tanakh, uh, and it there mentions that we have this, this day. Uh, that's sort of a, late, a latter day development. So even though it's part of Tanakh, it's still considered the Rabbanan. It's a, a rabbinic commandment because it's if the, ra the rabbis of those days. And we have a number of things which are fit in that same category of these are rabbinic commandments which were innovated still in the time of the Tanakh in the in biblical era. Uh, for example, the Eruv. Uh, last week, I spent a great deal of time with Rabbi Jachter working on the Eruv. Uh, the Eruv is a halachic wall around our city which allows us to carry within it. Uh, that was developed, that, 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 uh, this idea was, was developed by King Solomon. He innovated the Eruv. Uh, and that, uh, that has been in part of our, our practice since the times of King Solomon. So it's technically rabbinic, but it's biblical era. We have also the, the mitzvah of Yichud. A yichud is the prohibition for a man and a woman to be alone in, the, in, in a room together. Uh, and that that was innovated in the times of King David, uh, when there was uh, uh, Tamar and Amnon were half brothers, uh, half brother and, and sister. Um, but uh, Amnon raped his half sister, and from then on they made the rule of no, uh, no being alone uh, with uh, men and women being alone together in a room. Uh, and that's that's today to to this day not only a very prudent and wise. Uh, thing to do, but it's actually part of the halacha, and that that was it's a rabbinic it's a rabbinic requirement, it's a rabbinic commandment, but it happened in the times of the Bible in reaction to things that are recorded in the Bible. So so too, uh, we have the Megillah uh, and all of the mitzvot of Purim. So there, if we look at the mitzvot of Purim, I'm going to share the screen now, and here we see in the Book of Esther, part of the Megillah we have the mention of some of the mitzvot of Purim. Let's go back a little. Mordechai, and Mordechai recorded these events, and he sent dispatches to all the Jews throughout the provinces of King Ahasuerus, near and far. So th this is the Megillah, right? The, the writing of the Megillah. L'kayem uh, alehem, to charging them to observe the 14th and 15th of Adar every year, which uh, is what he's doing in this very document. Yeah, in the same days where the joys when the Jews enjoyed relief from their foes, uh, and the same month which had been transformed from them from one of grief and mourning to one of festive joy. 
right? That the 13th of Adar had been decreed by Haman as the day he's going to kill all the Jews. It's probably a Friday. That's where probably we get Friday the 13th. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if that's true, but uh, that was a day of, uh, you know, when we were panicked and, and scared and uh, mourning. And, and it was transformed, right? When the miracles that, uh, that happened in the Megillah transformed to a day where we, uh, we, right, when Nahafok, we sort of turned the tables on our enemies. And rather than them killing us, we, uh, we had, a, a, you know, a major uh, victory over all, right, all the anti-Semites, anyone who got up said, okay, it's time to kill the Jews. So we knew exactly who they were. And we had been given permission by Achashverosh to defend ourselves against, uh, against those who would, who would wish evil upon us. And, and so we did. And so that was on the 13th. And then on the 14th was the d- day after, right? The day after the, the war, if you will. <clears throat> so it says that these 14th days, which is now the time where we rest, right? Venachu. Uh, we rested from our from our enemies, uh, and that it was reversed. It was it was flipped, as it were. Uh, and so, so, what do we do with these? The days of drinking and, and celebration. Mishte is a party, uh, but it's it comes from the word lishtot, uh, the Hebrew word which means literally to drink. So it's a, it's a it's not a dry party. You may mishte v'simcha day of, of uh, drinking and celebration, umishloch manot ish and a sending of gifts of food, right? A manot means uh, uh, meals, you know, um, courses of a meal. Manari <laughs> shona is right, the appetizer. Manai uh, karit is the main course. And so umishloch manot to send meals or, or courses of meal, ish each person to their friend or to their neighbor. And gifts to the poor. So we see here, uh, right there in scripture, right there in the Megillah, it tells us some of the mitzvot of Purim. Uh, and so these are the mitzvot that we're going to be looking at uh, in a little more detail today. I know I sort of took me a while to get there, but I wanted to make sure we had the proper, uh, the proper background, right? That, that coming through, and we'll, we'll have, uh, perhaps we'll talk a little bit more about Parshat Zachor. And we will next next week. We'll talk more about Bajar Zachor and remembering Amalek. But today we're going to focus on these two mitzvot uh, of Mishloch Manot Ish Lareyehu of sending of gifts uh, in person to their neighbor or to the person to their their friend. Right, Reyehu is, is the same word as we use uh, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, yeah, so it it, uh, uh, it doesn't mean neighbor in someone who lives near you. Uh, it means neighbor in the sense of one who who is beloved. Uh, upon, uh, to you, one one who you who you care about, right? So the time to send gifts to those uh, whom you care about. And lev, you need my gifts and presents to the poor. Okay. And they accepted forever to to perform these commandments which they had begun to do. But the sher Mordechai and everything that Mordechai had written upon them in the Megillah. Okay. So here we're saying that that we have not only uh, is it written to do it? But we have accepted to do it. And so these mitzvot, which are mitzvot de Rabbanan, they are rabbinic commandments, even though they're written in scripture, they're sort of a biblical rabbinic, right? We have, there are even some things that, that are suggested that they are of rabbinic quality, right? That they're not scriptural commandments, but they were innovated by Moshe himself. Yeah, and there, there's, there's uh, uh, things of that, that rabbinic laws that, uh, that, like the idea of muktzah, that there's something uh, which... Uh, which you're not allowed to handle on Shabbat, even though the if, if, using it, you're not you, you're doing any malacha. You're not actually doing any transformative work. You're just handling a sickle, right? What's wrong with handling a sickle? And well, a sickle is a kind of a tool that you use to do prohib- prohibited labor, so you're not allowed to handle it, right? And so that idea of muktzah is, is perhaps uh, is a rabbinic idea, but it dates back to the era already of Moshe Rabbeinu, and it comes uh, very much from the parasha that we just read uh, Yesterday. Wow. Okay. So now we're going to go into, uh, into the halakhic literature. I want to first look at it in the Rambam. Uh, because it's good to see things in the Rambam. And the Rambam is, you know, he's uh, 700 years before the Kitzur Shulchan Aruch. 
uh, you know, he was writing 700 years before. And, and, uh, and you'll see that he, but he's also purposefully uh, brief, just the facts, ma'am. You know, he's not given a, well, that's not true. Sometimes the Rambam gives us little juicy nuggets uh, of, of big ideas uh, that, that sort of put the whole thing. But here we're going to look, look first at the, uh, the, the, these commandments in the Rambam. Okay, so we started here with Chayav. Chayav. Right, he goes, he first, talk, you know, sees the, uh, he's talking about the obligation of the Purim Suda, and we'll talk about that, uh, the, the Purim Suda and the drinking. Um, next week, you can see just here, it says, says the Rambam, you should drink wine until he becomes intoxicated and falls asleep from his intoxication. You know, that's, uh, that's a lot of wine. Uh, okay. And there's a whole thing about this Rambam, where does he mean that if you if you have a little wine and go to sleep, is that doing it, or do you need to pass out from from drinking? A whole a whole big question there. We'll talk about that next week. Okay, and likewise, a person is obligated to send two portions of meat, or two types of dishes, or two types of food to his fellow. Why does he say meat? There's nothing about it that says meat. I think the purpose of when he says meat, it doesn't mean that it has to be meat or that it has to be flesh. Uh, but the purpose is that it's not supposed to be something kitschy. Not supposed to be something cute or, or, uh, but it's supposed to be a proper meal, right? That when you give somebody mishloach uh, manot, it's supposed to be something that if they didn't, if they didn't have a Purim feast already uh, set up for them, that this could be their Purim feast. So when you see people that give, you know, a little package of Smarties and, uh, you know, and a box of raisins, that's a that's a skimpy, that's a skimpy, uh, a skimpy Purim suda. Now. It doesn't mean that you haven't fulfilled the mitzvah, right? And specifically, Mr. Loch Manot is, uh, is, is, it can be minimal. And it's much better that a person should uh, give a very small Mishloch Manot of Smarties and Raisins uh, and, and spend their money on Matanot Lev Yonim of giving uh, whole, you know, giving uh, open handedly uh, to the poor and the people who are needy. That's a much, uh, a much preferred way to spend your money on, on, on Purim than spend, send, spend, you know, uh, sending an elaborate gift basket to to your friends and and giving you know ten bucks to the poor, uh, better better to do it the other way certainly, uh, but he'll he'll come and he'll tell us that. But the idea is when he says send two portions of meat or two types of dishes or two types of food, it should be something that if uh, if, if, if if ideally right that this is, this is, should be something that if that's going to be their Purim Suda, that's going to be their Purim feast, that's going to be uh, still a Purim feast. As it says, in sending portions one man to another, or each person to their to their friends, two portions to one man, right? Mishloach manot, manot is plural. Ish uh, to one person, right? Uh, go back to that other. Mishloach manot plural. Ish lereehu. There's no yud in this reehu, so it's singular. So you set to ten two courses to one person, and that's the mitzvah. Of Mishloch Manot to send two courses, oops, two courses of food uh, at least to at least one person, and anyone who increases sending his friends is praiseworthy, right? And the more the better. Uh, that it's a good thing to do, and it's a, especially you know when you have people that you haven't heard of, or haven't heard from people. You know today we're we're distant from people. We have family members uh, and friends that uh, that we're not maybe not so in touch with, uh, you know. And if you can send them a Mishloch Manot. Or someone in the in the community that maybe you you uh, don't know so well and you want to get to know, right? It's another way to to sort of create a bond, or just as a as a token of uh, token of appreciation for the person, a token of friendship. Uh, all you know, again, you want to show somebody that you're my Rea, that you're my beloved friend. And if you don't have the means to do that, you should trade with this fellow, right? That you should say, okay, look, I don't, I have, uh, I, I got myself a falafel. For, for Purim, you got yourself a, a, a shawarma. Here, we'll switch, right? I give you my shawarma and you give me your falafel. Uh, now we both have having, we're both having a Purim Suda and we both have done Mishloch Manot. We've traded, right? This one sends his meal to that one and that one sends his meal to this one in order to fulfill and sending portions to one person to another, right? Each person to another. And the sense is that you want to give something that uh, that is, uh, you know, enough to make a Purim Suda, uh, ideally. Now, sometimes the people don't want to send uh, bread and, and this and that. Uh, in today's world, I was I was one year in Lakewood. Lakewood, for those who don't know, is uh, one of the uh, capitals of Torah in North America. 
it's a city, a small, a small city in New Jersey, uh, but uh, it, it became Rev. Aaron Cutler uh, uh, came and established a yeshiva there, uh, before, you know, after World War One, and uh, this became sort of the most prestigious yeshiva uh, in in the in the New World uh, for for many 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 years. Uh, today, it remains, uh, you know, a capital of of Torah. It's very very from. It's a very yeshivish place, right? All black hat, uh, right? The old joke is a guy goes to. Uh, to buy pizza for uh, for his family on Arab Pesach in Lakewood, wearing a blue shirt, right? And six people try to sell him their chametz. <laughs> That's the old joke, uh, right? The sense of the people there is a very, very, very firm place. I was there in uh, one. I had a friend, uh, a friend who married into a Lakewood family, a friend from Boulder, Colorado, big uh, you know, big hippie, married into a Lakewood family, and and he was there living in Lakewood. Uh, and he invited, invited us to come for Purim uh, when I was in Philadelphia. Uh, and he was there trying to give out homemade Mishloch Mono. No one would take him from him, right? Because the, the sense was, even in a place like Lakewood, where everybody's, everybody's from, the sense of uh, homemade, who, who, has, who gives homemade things today? It's not that there's no hefsher. I don't know what uh, this, what kind of meat, what, what level of, of consciousness are you keeping? You know, so... Uh, uh, you know, and it's perhaps appropriate, right? That, that, that today it's it's less um, it's less common that people are going to send food that was homemade. You know, it happens, right? Baruch Hashem, we have a neighbor here that uh, a person in, in our congregation who comes and brings us cookies every Shabbos. Uh, cookies are you know, so it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to have homemade uh, homemade goodies, right, that are brought to you. Uh, and I think that that's the way it should be. But in today's world, it's much more common that you see people uh, doing this sort of takeout uh, uh, or or these gift baskets, which have all kinds of packaged foods, right? That they're nothing, nothing which is uh, not uh, factory sealed. Uh, and depending on who you're giving it to, I think that's appropriate, right? That's uh, uh, like trick or treating, the uh, deal. Uh, you know, you, you, people don't want to receive things that are not uh, package sealed. Uh, so I think many people are, are like that today. But if you have someone that you can send to and, and give them a homemade, a homemade challah, you know, homemade hamantash and, uh, you know, a piece of uh, piece of meat, uh, you know, that you that you barbecued on, uh, you know, at home, uh, you know, the sense of the personal touch is really what it's about. You know, the personal touch of I'm sending you a gift of food and not because I think you're hungry. Right, this is not giving each other foods because we're hungry. That's the other mitzvah. That's the mitzvah of matanot lev yonim. We'll get to that shortly, of giving to the people who are needy. Uh, but the sense of, uh, of showing care, showing friendship, fellowship, yeah, that here we are, imagine, you know, put yourself in the, in the shoes of the Megillah. Here we are with all the Jews across the, across the empire are all panicking uh, and, and we're scared and we don't know what's going to happen and they're all going to come and kill us. And we have, uh, we have the one day where we can sort of defend ourselves. And we come in, and not only did we defend ourselves, we scored a tremendous victory. And all throughout the kingdom, the Jews are now uh, not only respected, but revered. Uh, and, uh, you know, we thought we were going to be going to be hated. Uh, and everybody is, is cheering, on, cheering on the Jews. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, we even have, it says that Rov Amea Arz, Midya Hadim, people were, were, Jews were coming out of the woodwork, people who were, had been denying that they're Jews, uh, or or perhaps they weren't Jews who now want to be Jews. They, they you know, they send the whole shift of public opinion, uh, you know. And so, in that context, everybody is, is celebrating. Hey, and it's just a, a party, and people are giving each other food. We're making a barbecue on the front porch. You know, you want to give everybody who passes by a little piece of chicken. Uh, you know, I think so. Uh, for people who are keeping kosher, it, it has to be you have to be very careful, you know, because you don't want to offend somebody. By sending them something that may or may not be kosher, you know, you're going to give them something. It can, it can be very, very careful and confusing. Uh, so, you know, appropriate to give to seal things when there's any question of, of, of kashrut uh, that, that needs to be thing. Uh, and, and it's sad, right? Uh, but uh, that, that's the nature of the world today. But I think that if you have the ability to give, uh, you know, if you, you give something that's uh, properly kosher, but also maybe some, some homemade touch or a homemade decoration. You know, you give a uh, give package, you have bakery uh, hamantashen from from the bakery, uh, but you can decorate it in a certain way or or make put some personal touch on it. 
that really shows that it's not just a, a, you know, it's not a bakery, it's not a ba it's not a factory mitzvah, it's not a bakery mitzvah. The whole pr purpose is to give uh, to uh, to your friend uh, as a sign of personal connection uh, and and to get out of the institutional sort of a prepackaged mishloach one note that you know I think is very important to give some personal touch uh, on it. But here it doesn't it's not it's not explicit here in the Rambam, but I think that that's that's part of the idea. Okay, so that's Mishloch Monot. The there is a a um, uh, you know an old an old, an old a Baba Misa they call right. What do you call a Baba Misa? It's a, a grandma story. You know that uh, people people think uh, what, what's the most famous Baba Misa in Judaism is that if you have a tattoo, you can't be buried in a Jewish cemetery, uh, right? That's what people think, uh, and that's what they tell people. Here's what they tell your kids to intimidate them, make sure they don't get a tattoo. Uh, but it's not really true, you know, that uh, the ground, the ground accepts everyone. Uh, and so, so that's not, that's not correct. And so it's also, one, one second, Giovanna, uh, it's also incorrect that there, there's a, a, an impression people have about Mishloch Monot that you have to give things that have two different brachot, right? That if I give you, I can give you uh, bread and wine, I make a, a mozi on one, you make a baripriya gafen, but I couldn't give you an apple and an orange because you make a baripriya eights uh, on both of them. That is incorrect. You can give two items that have the same bracha and that is perfectly kosher. So if you have chocolates, which uh, you're giving, which are shahakal uh, and a beer, which is also shahakal, uh, it's okay to give two things that have the same bracha. Yes, Giovanna. I have a question. You said about uh, you appointed the tattoo, right? I have a question like <laughs> converting, uh, you have to get inside the mikveh, right? And you have tattoo all over your body. Like in that case, what happened? Yeah, well, that's a very one. It's a good question. I, I knew that as soon as I mentioned it, we get on the on a whole tangent. But uh, when going into the mikveh uh, to convert or for her family purity, uh, you know, any 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 time that you have a mikveh that's uh, that's required, if you're going to go up on the Temple Mount, uh, even today, right? If you can go up on the Temple Mount, you need to first go go to the mikveh. So there, what you need to do is make sure that there's nothing stuck on your skin that's going to separate between the water and your skin. Now a tattoo, because the ink is actually underneath your skin, doesn't uh, doesn't post that kind of, cause that kind of a problem. Uh, nail polish, there's a whole conversation to be had, but nail polish is on your skin and it can come off, and so there is this, this is a, a, more of a problem of nail polish, uh, or of or of uh, makeup of any kind, you know, or or um, they're worried about uh, hair extensions, right? If a woman or a man has uh, has a, a hair extensions, right? A weave that's in there that's not natural hair that they're uh, that has that that could be a problem for the mikvah because uh, their hairs, which are part of their body, or may not be exposed to the water uh, where 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 they're tied together. Um, but but a tattoo is not a problem for the mikvah and it's not a problem for the cemetery. Yeah, you have more question? Yes, I do. Like it's the same like question about the conversion. Like if you go to a rabbi and you're like waiting for the conversion, can it actually do not make you convert just because you have tattoos? <laughs> it's a it's a wonderful question. You, you know, what can they do? You know, there's it's a very um uh, I'm not sure who you're gonna appeal to to make them change their mind. Uh, but having tattoos is not is not cause for rejecting conversion. Uh, according to the Torah, non-Jewish people are permitted to get a tattoo. It's not prohibited. Uh, you know, it's only prohibited to Jews. Uh, the, the the seven mitzvahs of Bnei Noach, uh, the seven Noahide laws apply to not all to all people. Uh, and there are certain kinds of tattoos which are idolatrous, uh, and that would be prohibited, right? To have an idolatrous tattoo, uh, right? Uh, you know, have. Uh, uh, you know, have some foreign god or or the name of a foreign god or something, uh, or a you know a, a tattoo, a form of a tattoo which is associated with with some idolatrous cult uh, would be prohibited. But even that would not would be not be cause per se for rejecting a convert. Um, you know, it, 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 you, I think that's the kind of a situation where you need to make clear uh, to them that uh, now that you're converting, you need to know that you're not allowed to get any more tattoos. Right, and that uh, that our sense is that uh, our body doesn't is not ours per se. Right, it's uh, on loan from God, and we're we're taking care of it, uh, and we don't have the right to uh, 
to defame it to, or, or to alter it, uh, of course, for medical purposes is different, right? Then we're, we're taking care of it. Um, right, so nobody's going to tell you that you can't have a, you know, a, a, a pacemaker or something, you know, for any, any medical thing uh, that, that, that's different. Um, but, uh, but tattoos and, and brands, right? Marking of the skin with burning uh, or cutting uh, to leave a scar, all of that is, is, is expressly prohibited. Uh, you know, uh, for Jews. And so, uh, you know, I think that's important that uh, today was a very lot of tattoo culture today, right? Perhaps more than more than any other time. So it's important that uh, as you have converts coming in to make it clear that, that getting another tattoo is uh, is prohibited, but you don't have to remove the ones you have. Uh, you know, I have a friend, a dear friend, uh, the breast liver uh, you know, lives in Israel, you know, he's got payas and all that. He's got beautiful dragon tattoos all up and down his body uh, from, before, from before he converted. Uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, it's, very, it's, it's astonishing sometimes you see, but uh, that it, it's, it's, uh, it's not a problem. Yeah, Giovanni, you have more, more question or is it your? It's kind of like, I'm thinking like uh, back to the Holocaust, uh, they tattoo Jews with a number. That's right, and that that uh, that's that's a terribly uh, uh, dehumanizing, you know, and as like, uh, and, and you know, and so it's certainly uh, certainly that. I I don't want to get overly distracted with the tattoos if, or anything else. If you want to have a, a longer conversation about that, I invite you to reach out to me. We can set a time. Uh, but let's not uh, let's not spend all uh, all our energy on tattoos when we're here, here to speak about Purim. Okay. Continues the Ramah Chayav. Adam lechalek l'anim b'yom Purim. You need to you are required to distribute charity to the poor in Purim. All right. This is not the same as giving tzedakah. It should be noted. It's not the you know there are some times that we have days in the calendar which are set aside to, for the performance of a mitzvah, which is not really connected to that day. I'll give you two examples. Uh, Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is a day that we set aside to do tshuva, right? There's a special mitzvah to do tshuva, to repent, uh, to confess and to sort of uh, repent uh, from your sins on Yom Kippur. But repentance is not a time-bound mitzvah. It's not, nothing, it's not specific to Yom Kippur. <clears throat> uh, and that's important because then women are, of course, not exempt from it because it's not a time-bound commandment, uh, but rather Yom Kippur is a day which has been sort of set aside for doing this mitzvah, which is always upon us to do. We always are commanded to repent. Whensoever we have the, the uh, re recollection of a sin that we did, we should immediately take a, a moment to say, oh, I'm sorry, I did that, Hashem, please forgive me. I won't do it again. You know, that, uh, that we always are commanded to repent. And yet this is a day that we're sort of taking the time to do that. I'll give you another example. Uh, Pesach. There's a commandment on Pesach. We say the story, we, you know, tell the story of the Exodus. We remember the, the Exodus from Egypt. Now, remembering the Exodus from Egypt is a, is a commandment that's always upon us. It's not a time-bound commandment. Uh, we, we learned just last week in the, in the Davinology class about how uh, it says, We have to remember the the exodus from Egypt today, every day of our, all the days of our lives, and that includes the nights, uh, and therefore is not a time-bound com commandment. Uh, and, and so uh, that's why women have to do that mitzvah on Pesach, because it's not a positive time-bound commandment. It's a general commandment. You have to, we have to remember the exodus from Egypt. It just happens that this is sort of a, a day which we're setting aside time to do that mitzvah. Right? And so Purim is, 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 you might think that Purim is similar, right? Where you have a mitzvah to give money to the ch to charity, to distribute charity to the poor. And Purim is the day that we're sort of taking the time to do that mitzvah. That is incorrect. That is not the case. If you have monies that have been set aside for tzedakah uh, and you, distributing them on Purim does not fulfill the mitzvah of giving gifts to the poor on Purim. Uh, it does not. Giving, if you, if you have money, uh, you know, in your own budget, right, that we're meant to, to give uh, to a tithe, 10% of our income to give to uh, charitable, uh, charitable causes, right, uh, or, or, 
donation, yeah. Uh, to give the money to the poor uh, from that money does not, you haven't fulfilled the mitzvah of, of giving gifts to the poor and poor. This is not just a day where we're doing tzedakah. This is in addition to the mitzvah of giving tzedakah, which is always a mitzvah to do. We have a special mitzvah of giving gifts to the poor, and it's not about money per se. Uh, uh, right? He's, he, and he's going to explain. So one is required to distribute. Uh, it's, it's, charity is the right. You see, there's no there's no word charity here in, in Hebrew, right? Uh, required to distribute to poor people on Purim, right? Uh, there's no, no there's no charity. It's, 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 there's no. It doesn't say tzedakah here, right? It's gifts to the poor, uh, and it's not about money per se. So he says. We do not give the less than two poor people, right? The, remember back in our verse in Esther? We had Mishloach, Manot, sending two courses to one person. And here we have Umatanot, gifts to multiple poor people. So now you have to give to at least two people. And you have to give to, you know, give gifts to at least two people who are, who are poor or, or, or needy, right? This is different than Mishloach, Manot, which is not about need. It's about affection and showing uh, fellowship and affection. And here, this is about specifically people who have need, but it's not just so simple as they need, I have, I give to them. Uh, he's going to tell us it's, 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 uh, it's better, for, better than that. One gives, you know, gives a gift to each one. Give one gift to each, at least two people. Coins, right? You can give money or types of dishes or types of food, right? It's, you can also give food as the, as the gift. Uh, and it's not, uh, it's not limited to, to money, and it's not really limited to food either. Uh, to give a present to somebody, you know, that, it, that you know happens to be needy, but you didn't give them a, a, you know, a handout of, of you, know, you gave them a nice, uh, you know, a nice, uh, I don't know what the, what the brand is, right? Uh, a nice uh, designer sweatshirt, right? You give them something really, really nice that, that you know, that, that's a gift to the poor. And that you're not just giving them something that they need; it's also lifting their spirit, right? You're giving them, uh, you're giving, you're showing them uh, kindness in a way that is is more than just uh, material utility. Oops, so many tabs. Okay, the applicants of the room should not be scrutinized. Normally, when we're giving to Dunker, we have to anal an analyze who do we want to give it to, who's the best cause. There are all these priorities in giving, right? Who do we have to give it to? Our people who are, who are local first or people who are in more dire straits. We want to avoid giving it to people who are going to sort of squander the money on, on, uh, on things we don't think are, are uh, worthy, right? We want to, so there's all a question of wanting to make sure when we give our, our tzedakah that we're going to give it to people who are deserving and worthy and are going to put it to good use. Uh, we don't, that's not, that's not necessary on Purim. We don't, we don't even, we don't even do that. Uh, the applicants for poor money should not be scrutinized. It should be given to anyone who holds out their hand. All right? This, here's the call the, the, the Yad, the Tol Nimlo. Anyone who puts out their hand as if, you know, please, sir, uh, you know, uh, you, you're supposed to give to anyone and everyone that you see. Uh, you know, you see kids in Israel coming out, Kol HaPoshet Yad Nimlo. Right? They come and they hold their hand. They say, anyone who puts out their hand, you give to them. Uh, and, you, and, and so it's good to, uh, you know, to, to make that a practice. This is also this is also something which I think is an important spiritual uh, a sense of, of you know in, in a celebratory mood uh, we don't want to be stingy uh, and the sense of when Purim is in many ways a day when we're going to see uh, how 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 who who are you really you know uh, the the rabbis have they say. You can tell you can tell a person by three things, right? That you should really get the sense of who they are. Bekaso, bekoso, bekiso, uh, right? There's three words that all sound the same. Bekaso means in their anger. Uh, what makes a person angry when when he ticks a person off? Then then you sort of see, oh, you get to see what's what's in the kishkas of that person when 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 they when they you're able to anger them. Now, not that you should, right? Not that you should be trying, but that that sort of shows uh, shows their kishkas uh, what, what's inside of them. Bekaso. Uh, that's that's their anger. Bekoso in their cup, meaning when they're inebriated, when they're drunk, they sort of act, they let down their guard a little bit. You get the sense of who they really are, uh, uh, you know, and, and that, that sort of comes out. 
and Bikiso with their pockets, you know, and how do they give their, how do they distribute their money, and particularly on Purim. Uh, and also we say that God keeps this, God keeps it, th this commandment as well, right? That So it's a particular time, uh, an opportune time for prayer for anyone who has a great need for, for anything, right? Remember in the Megillah, there's a thing where um, when Esther appears before the king, right? She summons up the courage uh, and goes and appears before the king unsummoned. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and it could be the end of her. Uh, and, and the king uh, raises the golden scepter and says, to her, what, uh, Esther, uh, my, my queen, what can, I, what can I do for you? You know, uh, what, is your, what is your ask and what is your request? Yeah, I, up to half the kingdom and I'll give it to you. And we have a sense that the God is doing the same thing on Purim. He's coming to us and saying, uh, Israel, my queen, uh, what is your request? What is it that you want? You know, uh, what, is, what is it that you're asking for? Uh, up, up to half of the kingdom, right? And I'll, and I'll give it to you. Uh, and anyone who puts out their hand, you know, you have to give on Purim. Uh, so in the same way that we, it's a proper time to, to daven for anything that you need, for something that's a, it's a, a very, very uh, opportune day for for. Hashem is in a, in a uh, you know, the Ketov Lev HaMelech B'yayin, like it says in the Megillah, uh, that uh, when, when the king's heart was, was joy with wine, you know, and so, so too the, the king, uh, the real king, uh, Ampurim is, is, is in, a, in a jolly mood and willing to be giving. So appropriate to really daven, uh, you know, in, in Hasidic circles, you see on Purim Mincha, in the afternoon prayer, uh, people, uh, it's like the Super Bowl of davening. People really go to town. They really dive in because this is this is when the king's in a good giving mood, uh, really opportunity. But also the, to the degree that we give, uh, so also we're given to, you know. And, and when you open your open your hand and open your heart, uh, that uh, that it, you know you can make um, making a real impression on God, as if to say, you know, I'm giving, you give uh, as well. Okay, poor money must not be diverted to any other charity. We don't. Uh, you, you know, you can't say, oh, we're giving to, uh, to the foundation that does this, that, or the other thing. You really want to make sure that the, money, that the gifts to the poor is actually distributed uh, to the people in need on Purim Day. Uh, and it's not, it's not something in general that you add to the, uh, you know, to, to, to the fund that's going to take care of orphans. It has to be something very practical and tangible that you give to the poor on Purim Day. Okay. Uh. One should rather spend more money on gifts to the poor than on his Purim banquet and on presents to his friends. This is very important. You know, how much the elaborate things we had, uh, you know, people make for Purim Suda, make the most grand meal of the year. Some people make it for Pesach Seder, some people make it for Purim Suda. But certainly, you know, top five uh, meals of the year is the Purim Suda. You see people going to make an elaborate and, and fancy and delicious, wonderful dishes. Uh, you know, it's appropriate. Uh, I had once a uh, buffalo tongue. Right from, <laughs> you know that uh, this this is going for the for the blue label stuff uh, on Purim, uh, but say says it's much better that you should spend that money on gifts to the poor uh, and and giving to people uh, who are in need rather than uh, splurging on on delicacies for your for yourself uh, on the Purim and and on the presents for your friends. No joy is greater and more glorious than the joy of gladdening the hearts of the poor, the orphans, the widows, and the strangers. You know, the best thing, uh, it's not just that you're, you, you, you're, you're giving them, you're taking care of their needs. It's not a cold giving, right? But on Purim, you want to make sure that they're taken care of. You want to give to them with a good heart and, and gladden them. The Rambam says in another place that the best way, uh, the best way to fulfill the, these three, the three commandments of, of the Purim feast and giving to the poor and Mishloach Monot is to invite a poor person to your, to your banquet. Invite someone who's needy and have them come to your home and, and bring them food. And in that doing, you're doing all three at once. Uh, but moreover, you're extending your heart to them. You're making them feel uh, cared for and beloved. Uh, we have an opportunity. We're having a wonderful Purim Suda at the, at the show this year, uh, sponsoring someone in need or, or, or buying, you know, buying a meal for someone who, who, who doesn't have one is a wonderful way to invite them to come participate in the community, include them in the community, and they, and they feel welcomed and included 
uh, and they're getting, you know, the, 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 the fact that they're needy and there's has a wonderful meal uh, that they're invited to this. So that's, that's the prime way to fulfill all of the mitzvot at once. And in the sense that the, the lifting of their hearts, right, the gladding of their hearts, as we say, it's a day of cel- joy and celebration. Uh, so that's, that's the essence of it. Right? And so taking care, and unfortunately, we have in our community today uh, uh, orphans, uh, I don't know, widows probably, you know, we, there are people uh, in the Jewish community here in Vancouver uh, in dire need, and it's appropriate that we reach out to them. Uh, and so anyone who wants to, uh, to do Matanot by, uh, Levionim uh, by sponsoring, you know, uh, you know a, a, a free meal for someone to come to the shul and participate in the Purim Surah, that's a, a really a, a wonderful way to do it. Okay. Uh, Gladdening the hearts of the poor, the orphans, the widows, and the strangers. He who gladdens the heart of these unhappy people imitates God, as it says, "I am, uh, I am Hashem to revive the spirit of the humble and to put uh, and to put heart into the crushed." Right, the sense if you give you give them their heart back, you, you show them show them that they're cared for, that they're not alone, uh, and that they're included in, in the celebration and the joy of the community. Okay, and we're going to switch away from the Rambam. We have just a few minutes left, but we're going to get a few more. Uh, a few more details here. Okay. And Purim, everyone is required to send no less than two gifts to one person, right? We saw that. As it says, any gifts of food to one another, which implies two gifts to one person. The more gifts you send to your friends, the more praiseworthy. Nevertheless, it is much better to give generously to the poor than to have lavish feasts and send extravagant gifts to your friends. There's no greater, more glorious need Joy before the Holy One, blessed is he, that to gladden the hearts of the poor and the orphans of the widows. Whoever gladdens the hearts of the unfortunate is compared to the divine presence and says to revive the spirit of the humble and revive the heart of the crushed. You can see that he's taking that straight from the Rambam, who's get, taking it straight from the Gemara. Okay, this is that, that, that's very clear. So this idea that uh, we want to, instead of, uh, you know, spending lavishly on our Purim feast, we want to want to put the emphasis of our, of our Purim expenditures on, on, uh, on the gifts to the poor. And again, that can be gifts of, of any kind. Uh, that can be gifts of, uh, but it needs to be something that they can take benefit right up, right away, right? Clothing uh, or um, food or money, uh, you know, other, other, other things uh, that, are, that are tangible and given. Unfortunately, you know, giving them a, a scholarship, uh, you know, for, for something is not uh, as, as wonderful as that is. And I fully, you know, encourage people to, to give to scholarship funds and to, to do that, that's not an appropriate way to fulfill the mitzvah of Purim because they're not going to be able to receive that benefit uh, on the day itself. Okay, this is in a, in a, in a little, little detail. The term Mishloch Manot, right, uh, foods, implies only food that is ready to eat without preparation by the recipient, right? To give them a box, uh, you know, that needs to be cooked or, uh, you know, is not, uh, you can't do that. Uh, you don't fulfill the mitzvah by giving them a box of macaroni and cheese or, or something that needs to be cooked. Uh, or something which is not ready to eat as as is, right? So it should be cooked meat or fish, but not if it's uncooked. Candy, fruits, wine, mead, uh, or similar delicacies is acceptable, right? Things which can be eaten as they are or drank. Okay, even every person. This is this is important uh, that we didn't we didn't see this explicit in the Rambam, but it's it's not uh, it's not obvious, uh, and therefore it's appropriate that we mention it. Every person, even a person who is, who, is, who is poor and dependent on, even the poorest in is, of Israel, who is dependent on, uh, on, on charity, is required to at least two gifts to two poor persons. Let's give one to each person, as it says, Matan of Leonian, we give to the poor. Right? That's, even if you're not uh, well off and even if you have barely enough for yourself, still to give something uh, is, is important. And it shows that the spirit of, of the day is not about effectiveness but about giving right that when uh you know part of it is yes effectiveness we want to give to people things that they need um you know but but in the vulnerability of of drunkenness and of celebration and of uh revelry uh this is also a time where we really want to emphasize midot uh the, the what are the characteristic traits that we want to embody you know, uh, and uh, as you see in people and you see uh, when you're a little bit looser uh, than, than normal from, from, from drinking a little bit, uh, you know, so that that moment you want to be a giver. You want to be someone who has what to give. 
uh, and to be giving and be be looking at the world and how can I help? How can I make a difference? How can I how can I help? You know, and that that's the sense of the the primary characteristic uh, that we're trying to engender in ourselves always is is helpful is that volunteer spirit. Uh, we read about that in the parsha, uh, all the parsha about giving all the people who wanted to come and give, and they were they were giving more for the temple than need, than was needed, right? This is because the 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 revelry, the moment, the time of revelry. What we want to bring is that spirit of generosity uh, and of giving. So even someone who uh, who is poor and dependent on on uh, charity, nevertheless, should still be in that place of giving and not saying, "Oh, I'm a, I'm a receiver. I'm not a giver." No, no. Everybody has what to give, and it can be as little as you know, you know, uh, a bite of my sandwich. Right? I'm I'm here having a peanut butter and jelly sandwich for my Purim Suda. That's all I can have. You know, but I see someone here. You can have half. You know that 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 person is give is doing mishloach manot. Uh, and doing matanot lev yonim, uh, right? And that 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 generosity is, is very dear to Hashem, and it's not uh, it's not about the quantity per se, but about the good the kindness of heart that's expressed. Okay, it implies two gifts to two poor people. You should not be selective in giving your, your your gifts on Purim. Whoever holds out his hand to ask for charity should be given a donation. If you're in a community where there are no poor people, right? There's no nobody poor in Vancouver. Mm. Uh, you should either keep the money to the meet needy persons or send it to them. Ideally, you should send it to them. We want to have it be like actually deployed on Purim. Uh, you don't want to keep it in, in your in your hand. Now, if it happens to be there's really no one, you can't find someone you know needy. Uh, they don't have to be Jewish. They don't have to be uh, anything. You know, anyone who's who's in need uh, that you can give them that they'll be happy to receive what you have to give them is good. You know, there's a guy who sits outside a Safeway. Uh, you know, finding finding someone. Uh, to whom to give, uh, you know, in in, in uh, Illinois, in the college town, we would make a, make a brisket sandwiches, you know, we go and get, distribute them to the homeless people, uh, you know, and and I think that the the sense of um, chesed, right, that, that we want to be Purim is not just a day of like, you know, this is the prototypical. They tried to kill us, we won. Let's eat. This is this is that holiday, you know. Uh, but there's also they tried to kill us, uh, we won. Let's give charity. Let's give tzedakah. Uh, you know, let's let's distribute uh, food and and gifts uh, and do good for the world, and that's that's how Jews celebrate. You know, and I think that says so much about the character of our people and the kind of people that we want to be. Is that we're in a victory celebration. Uh, we're 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 giving. Okay. Women too are required to send mishloach manot, gifts of food, and to give gifts to the poor. Right. This is this is a positive commandment. That is time bound, and why are women involved? And the same thing goes with the Megillah. All the four mitzvot of Purim, uh, a woman is is just as obligated as a man. Why? Uh, and the answer that they give is because they were also included in that miracle. Uh, Haman wasn't going to save the Jewish women, you know. Uh, he, he, you know the 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 uh, genocide is genocide, you know. Um, and they were going to kill us all, and they were also part of the miracle. And also, not only were they part of the uh, of the miracle, and that they were saved. We also see that this is one of the one of the uh, prime, you know, the, the prime heroine of the story was was, was a woman here, right? This is uh, Mordechai as well, right? Mordechai and, and Esther uh, both. Uh, but really, at the end of the day, it's called the Book of Esther. It's not called the Book of Mordechai, and she was the one who risked her life and had to go into uh, into the king, uh, and she was the one whose charm and grace was highlighted, and uh, and she was the the how do you say the the finger of God that wrought salvation, you know. Uh, so, so when we say that women were involved in that miracle, uh, in, indeed they were, right? Uh, indeed, indeed. And so, women are included in this in all of these mitzvot. Uh, a married woman and a married man are considered one uh, financial being. So, in in terms of their giving, uh, but if there's two of them involved, so uh, right, so they should give instead of just. Uh, uh, you know, to, to one person for Mishloff, one order to two people for gifts to the poor, you should give to two and four, right? And, uh, and double double the, the number that they're giving. Okay. And uh, there, there's a sense uh, that, you know, now to be too, too uh, effuse in our celebration, uh, it's appropriate women should send Mishloff one to women and men to men. That we don't want to get confused in in terms of the the celebration of of, of uh, inviting a spirit of licentiousness in, uh, and furthermore, there's even a possibility that a, 
you know, that, uh, people, you know, it's not Valentine's Day, you know, and that people shouldn't get, uh, get confused. Um, that, that, that's not the spirit of Purim, uh, qu quite the contrary, right? That the whole, the whole, um, there's a whole nother sheer we could talk about uh, sexuality in the Megillah uh, and as a whole nother thing but here that they want to be they want to be careful now that we shouldn't uh, shouldn't start giving mixed messages that are uh, not to be not to be uh, unclear okay regarding donation to the poor women may send uh, right regarding donation to the poor however women may send to men and conversely men to, may send to women right there when it's giving to the for the poor it's not so much about uh, an uh, it, the, an articulation of, of uh, affection, uh, and rather is is uh, you know wanting to give and to lift spirits. So that that's uh, that's okay. Some women rely that their husband the husbands give on their behalf, but this is not proper. They should be stringent about this. That everybody should act be active and participating. Okay, as you can see, next he goes into uh, uh, in, into all the things about the the celebratory uh, meal. And uh, the role, the the role of wine and alcohol in, in Purim. Uh, we'll talk about that next next week. Uh, next week we're going to be covering Parshat Zachor, the mitzvah of remembering Amalek and the the war that we're commanded to fight against Amalek in every generation, and the mitzvah of the celebration of Purim and how it is that that uh, fulfills right. How is it that we're fulfilling the mitzvah? And uh, and the famous the famous uh, statement of uh, of our sages that a person should be inebriated on Purim to the point that they can't distinguish between curse Haman and bless Mordechai. Uh, and there's a lot of all kinds of things and people who, who perhaps thought uh, thought this means something that it doesn't mean or thought it doesn't mean something it does mean. Uh, so we're going to try and make sense of all of that that next week. I know that's biting off a lot because what are the two things a uh, uh, Malik uh, and drinking have to do with each other, but that's uh, that's what we're going to try and connect to. next week uh, as we get closer and closer to Purim. Please check out all the wonderful classes and activities and other things that we have going on at the show. This is really we're coming out of the uh, out of the pandemic. We've had uh, restrictions lifted. We can eat together in the show. You know, it's really an, an awesome awesome moment for us to celebrate as a community. And I, I encourage everyone to get into it. You know, they. Uh, uh, in Israel, they say that the, the Purim and Pesach uh, are inverted. What do I mean? Uh, you know, they say in, in Chutzlar, in, in the diaspora, Purim is for the kids and Pesach is for the grown-ups. But in Eretz Yisrael, Purim is for the grown-up and, Pes and Pesach is for the kids. Uh, and I think that there's, there's a lot, uh, Purim gets to be sort of this cute holiday that we want to make for the kids, right? And, and, uh, but uh, there's so much depth uh, and so much richness and, and really uh, subtlety and, and um, texture to Purim, you know, that, that more than perhaps any other holiday that uh, has some adult themes and, and a lot of uh, good things for us. So I encourage everybody not to, not to have a juvenile Purim, you know, that uh, really let's update our, not, not to have a pediatric Purim, you know, to say, let's really have, uh, let's get educated, let's involved. Read the Megillah, you know, and, and and let's have a really a really special Purim together uh, this uh, this coming Purim. Have a wonderful week, and I will see you again. Thank here. you, Rabbi. That was really great. Uh, Baruch Hashem. I'm so glad. Thank you. Okay, have a good week, and we'll see each other. Uh, for those who want, uh, when, tomorrow we have. I'll, I'll be teaching uh, my Mondays. Uh, I I don't know if Rabbi Rosenblatt is starting with his Megillah shir in, uh, tomorrow already. But that should all be available uh, uh, clear on the web on the website. Check out the, the schedule. I'll be doing my Mondays uh, tomorrow and Davenology again on Wednesday. Have a wonderful, wonderful week.